How do professional linguists find out, figure out what ancient languages sounded like, say, Latin? There are no ancient Romans alive, we have no recordings of an ancient Roman speaking, so how do we know how that language was pronounced? Let's find out. Hello, noble ones, and welcome back to Metatron's Academy, the channel where we explore how to learn languages the most fun and effective way possible. I have been speaking about Latin, specifically classical Latin, for a very long time now, and every time I make a video where I use the classical or restored pronunciation, I get people in the comments saying, we have no way to know. It's impossible to know what Latin sounded like. There is no way you can be sure that that's the way the ancient Romans pronounced it. Hence, studying classical Latin pronunciation is a complete waste of time. And of course you also have comments where people get offended by the fact that we use classical Latin pronunciation. <laughs> ah, welcome to the internet. Now, let me get one thing right off the bat. Is it easy to figure out what an ancient language sounded like? No. Although I have to say that not all ancient languages are the same sort of mystery to unlock, in the sense that Latin itself is probably one of the easiest, because it's one of the most documented ones. And that is really one of the things that baffles me when I see people telling me, oh, it's impossible to know that that's what classical Latin sounded like. Well, the people that say it's impossible or believe that we literally need to rely onto an actual recording, like an audio recording, and that would be the only way to understand what a language sounded like, really haven't spent one minute of their life looking into how linguists use very specific techniques to reconstruct such languages. With that being said, I would like to begin by explaining how languages are reconstructed. There are several routes that linguists can pursue to figure out and piece together what a language most likely sounded like. But before I mention all of these, I'd like to underline that, of course, this classical Latin pronunciation is our best guess at trying to figure out what Latin sounded like. Of course, it's debatable. That's part of the fun of it. It is, however, also important to underline that an educated guess with thousands of hours of study of not only linguistics in general, but all the Romance languages around the ancient language we're trying to reconstruct and the cultural situation and people who have put hundreds of hours into reading the ancient texts, understand the poetry of the time, understand the rhythms of the poetry of the time, have dedicated their lives into seeing how languages change over time and what are the most common evolutions and transformations of specific syllables and patterns. An educated guess coming from linguists like this has a huge weight into the discussion. And I do read people that try to minimize it and say, well, it's just a guess. Yes, but it's a guess that comes from thousands and thousands of hours of hundreds of linguists in collaborations with all sorts of different fields, from sculpture to archeology span to literature, lots of fields joining together, trying to reconstruct said language. So it's not just a guess. But what are these roots? Well, first and foremost, we want to see if the people that spoke said language as a first language, aka the ancient Romans, told us anything about it. And guess what? The ancient Romans would never shut up about Latin. If we back up a little bit, mostly this is done for educational purposes when we look at languages as a whole. And if you think about it, it isn't that odd. We do it today. How many books have been written and how many videos and how many conferences and pamphlets and dictionaries and pronunciation guides have been created about the English language alone? Well, they did it too. And on this video, we'll review a few of these. And some of these mentions and, and things that we've been told by the people who spoke these languages, in this case Latin, directly are so clear because they were professional teachers of said language, that at the end of the day, that already is a huge help. Secondly, we can look at the surrounding languages spoken in the surrounding 
cultures and civilizations around, in this case, Rome. We can see, for example, how names or words that are Latin but are being introduced in other languages and people start to use them, we can see how they pronounce these sounds and how they write them. For example, let's have a look at these two very famous names, Caesar and Cicero. If we look at the way they were pronounced through the reconstructed classical pronunciation, they would be pronounced Caesar and Cicero, respectively. Now, regardless of the plethora of evidence that supports uh, both the hard C sound, so not ch, not s, but k, but also the full on diphthong ai for Caesar instead of Cesar, and all the other small details on this part, I'd like to focus on how these two words, these two names, were pronounced around the Romans. So, of course, these were famous people. Therefore, these names are borrowed in and enter other vocabulary of other languages. For example, in Greek, the way they write uh, Cicero, they write it with a K, Kikeron. So, that already gives us an idea that if the Roman pronounced it Cicero or Cicero or Cicero, why did the Greeks use a K? Because they sounded, the, they, they heard the sound K and they wrote it down in the letter that they would use to represent that sound. And it's the same with Caesar. But what's interesting about Caesar is that even in German and all the different tribes and all the different and old versions of German, all the way up to modern German, if I'm not wrong, they say Kaiser. So the idea is they still use a K sound because ancient tribes of that area in that period heard it as a K sound, the diphthong was I. It wasn't just E, and most importantly, the C is hard. These are just a couple of examples. There are a myriad of examples like this that help us support that our understanding of how these words are pronounced and how these sounds are created that we get from the Romans is correct. Rhythm within poetry and literature was incredibly important in ancient languages, both in ancient Greek and in Latin. And that also helps us understand, for example, when a word is supposed to have two or three syllables. So that helps us defend ideas such as this diphthong is pronounced I fully and not just E. And also helps us defend many others, such as the V read as a, as a full on vowel, the M as a nasalized vowel. All of these things that sound strange because we don't use them anymore and make people cringe sometimes for whatever reason that God really is beyond me. These sounds can be defended because when we introduce the reconstructed classical pronunciation into the actual expected rhythm in terms of syllables within ancient poetry, guess what? It matches beautifully. Another thing that linguists use to try and reconstruct and get more data when it comes to a reconstructed pronunciation is mistakes, typos, errors of spelling. Well, think about it. Look at the English words there, there, and there. A lot of people get these confused. I mean, look at the comments on my main channel. This suggests that the pronunciation is either exactly the same or at least very, very similar, depending on the speaker. And this is something that you can understand even if you had no recordings whatsoever. Mistakes help us also understand and identify specifically when, for example, the pronunciation of the H as an aspirated sound was dropped in Latin. For example, through the sources we can see when the H started to become mute, when people started dropping it even though they weren't supposed to, in the sense that in ecclesiastical Latin the H is completely muted. You don't pronounce it, just like in Italian. That is because it's been influenced by the Italianate pronunciation. With that being said, we have absolute overwhelming proof that the H was instead aspirated, very similarly to English, in classical Latin. And we can see that because there is a specific time we can pinpoint in history when people start dropping these H's and that's exactly when they started to not pronounce them. And we see grammarians and Latin teachers complaining about it, complaining about the fact that now the youth or the uneducated people don't even pronounce their H's. Mistakes are great because they help us understand when, for example, a letter is not pronounced. Look at the word fruit. In the word fruit, the I is not pronounced. No one really says fruit. Uh, and that's the same in, for example, the word friend. You don't say friend, 
So if someone in 2000 years finds someone who isn't particularly educated and misspells it without putting the I, they can guess, if this is a common occurrence, that yeah, in this word you shouldn't pronounce the I. It has no sound. Well, this happened a lot in Latin, and we can find people explaining these mistakes too. phonemic vowel length. You see, Latin differentiates between long vowels and short vowels. Let me give you an example. Imagine the five vowels that normally you use in many Romance languages. A, I, U, E, O. These, the way I've pronounced it, would be the equivalent of classical Latin vowels that would be considered short. But these five vowels also had a long counterpart, in the sense that the vowel is extended in time. So, A becomes A, I becomes I, U becomes U, E becomes E, and O becomes O. So you extend it, you keep pronouncing it for a longer period of time. And it was so important for them that they tell us which vowels are long and which vowels are short, in the sense that people could ask, well, how do you know? How do you know that Lorica segmentata has the O and the E both being long. How do you know that? And then of course you get those that tell you it's impossible to know, it's just a guess. It's not a guess. The Romans told us, look at this, look at this image. You will notice that, you will notice that the E sound, when it's supposed to be E, the E itself, which would be an English I, is taller than the rest. If it's short, it's a short vowel. If it's tall, it's a long vowel. And you will find these markings all over the place. You'll notice that when the O or the E are supposed to be long, they will have a little cut on top of it. If someone hasn't read what the ancient Romans say about their own language, they might think there's just a little chip, a piece of stone that broke off. It's not. That's not random. That is specifically designed to help people understand, okay, that's how you pronounce it. That's a long vowel, that's a short vowel. Alright, well I hope that you enjoyed this lesson of Classical Latin. I will be posting very soon a full five minutes of spoken, fluently spoken Classical Latin. It's sort of a re-upload of an older video that I posted on my main channel that I will post here, but only the section in Latin, because the older video also had a full-on lesson on linguistics that I think I wanted to divide into separate videos for this channel. But make sure to stay tuned because I will be publishing that video soon. Of course, let me know what you think and share your opinions, and whether you like or not Classical Latin, of course it's entirely up to you, but if you do like it, I will be posting tutorials on both Classical Latin and Ecclesiastical pronunciation. Thank you very much for watching, don't forget to join Metatron's Academy, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.